Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Dorothy Kittner. I'm Assistant Dean and Director of Corporate Relations here at the Olin Business School. I want to welcome each of you here, and on behalf of Dean Mark Taylor, I want to welcome you as well. Um, he's traveling on behalf of the school, so he's sorry he couldn't be with you here today uh, for this particular um, event, which is the Olin Business Research Series. This is an opportunity for us to share the research of our amazing faculty with individuals like yourselves. Um, we like to bring together business and research and bring their thoughts and get them in front of you for your review. And this all started as it relates to the Olin Award, which is an annual process where our faculty members submit papers for review by a group of corporate senior um, and CEOs of companies all around the country, and they select the best papers to move forward, and, and one actually is awarded a $10,000 prize, but some of the top papers that are provided to us as well in the process, we like to showcase them, and you get to hear um, about one of them today. I also want to recognize Richard Mahoney, who's here. He is our distinguished executive in residence at the Olin Business School. It's his idea for us uh, to be a little more progressive. It was his brainchild to start to think about ways to get this amazing research of our faculty in front of corporate people like you. So we want to thank him for his generosity and continued support of this particular program as well as the Olin Award and many other programs here at the Olin Business School. I'm just going to give you a little bit of overview. I know you have in front of you um, details about uh, Professor um, Manella here today with us, who's going to share with you a little bit about his research. He is an associate professor of finance. He joined the business school in 2011. He got his PhD and MBA from the University of Chicago. And he also has a Bachelor of Arts in Economics and Computer Science from Boston University. He um, has three children, he shared with me, but when he wants to get away from them and come to work, um, he has the opportunity to teach both our undergraduates and graduate business school students, which is pretty cool. He just shared with me something pretty amazing. When this building opened, it just recently opened over three years ago, he was one of the very first professors to actually teach in this new building here at the Olin Business School. So before I turn it over to him um, and get the program going, I just again want to thank you for being here. And if there's anything we can do for you, if you want to get better connected with the professor today or any other professors or you have some research ideas you want to share with us and work with some faculty, um, I'd be happy to connect you as well as Jennifer Krupp and Laura Benoit. They're here from the corporate relations team. So thank you again for being here. He's going to present for maybe 25 minutes or so, and then we're going to open it up for questions with the greatest of intention to make sure you're out of here by 9 o'clock so you can continue with your day. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dorothy. Thank you all for coming here, I guess, this early in the morning. With three small kids, this is essentially an afternoon for me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and thanks to, to Dick for organizing this. I mean, the, as academics, we tend to we tend to go off on a tangent every now and then because we really want to show how our research contributes to a, a literature that a lot of people have thought about before. And um, I really appreciate the opportunity to try and build bridges from those tangents where we are at. Uh, to business practice. Um, so this is my, my attempt to do this. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me throughout. The, um, of course, I look forward to any ideas that you may have afterwards. Um, what, what we do in this paper, this, and this is a joint work with uh, Dick Wahoo and Brian Kelly, who are at the University of Chicago. Um, what we try and do in this paper is um, is a bit ambitious in the sense that we're trying to come up with an asset pricing model that can explain variation in asset prices not just in equities separately or bonds separately or 
options separately. We're, try we're really trying to come up with an asset pricing model that can be a, a unifying theory of asset pricing. Uh, and that really should be where we are trying to go as a literature, uh, as a profession. But so far, we've been pretty deficient in our ability to do this. So if you work at a fixed income desk, probably you're using fixed income models. If you're working in an equities desk, you're probably using just you know models that were designed for equities. And the risk when you're doing that is that you may overfit the data substantially. Your in other words, your model might work very well for that asset class in the small sample that you're looking at, but it might work terribly in other asset classes or as you go out of the sample in which you fit your data. And the trick, really, uh, one of the tricks that have been useful for, uh, for scientists is to use theory to guide your empirical analysis. And the hope when you do that is that as you go to other samples or as you go to other asset classes, that theory is sound, then your model should work well in those other settings. Um, so the question we're trying to answer here, fairly fundamental, um, I would say the biggest question in asset pricing is why do some financial assets earn consistently higher uh, like average or mean returns than other asset classes, other assets? Now, there are many other irrational stories you can come up with. You can say, well, some are hyped more, some are hyped less. None of this today in this talk. I'm going to think about rational theories that explain this, uh, this variation. Uh, so for example, um, you may say small stocks earn higher returns than large stocks. Okay, that's an empirical observation. But we would like to explain that. And in a rational market, such return differences are always explained by differences in risk exposure. So if small stocks are exposed to systematic risk um, more than other stocks, then in rational markets, an investor in them will have to be compensated for bearing this risk. The way that they are compensated is by getting higher returns on this in the market. And there is no such, you know, it's not like there's a market out there that decides what's the return that's going to come. The way that this will work is that people will trade in these stocks, and if there are very risky stocks to hold, they will uh, be willing to pay less for them. So the price today falls until, this, until the place where the expected return on them is relatively high. Okay? So high risk, high reward. Now finding such a parsimonious set of risk factors is really challenging. And I'm going to have two criteria for this parsimonious set of risk factors because there's many of them out there. I'm going to look for ones that well, they have to explain this cross-section variation in average returns. But I'm going to look for ones that are theoretically motivated and that empirically work well. And that's a surprisingly uh, hard hurdle to cross. So what do we do in this paper in a nutshell? We provide a simple two-factor extension, if you will, of the CAPM, the capital asset pricing model. Uh, how many of you have heard of the cap -end? Thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> so I was, looking for a, I was looking for a benchmark, and this is as good as it gets. It's a beautiful model, uh, and, most, uh, and, and most of our students, and I'm guessing students in other schools, are exposed to this model. But I'm going to show you that a small addition, uh, or a small extension to the cap -end, that in addition to market risk, accounts for exposure to intermediary, ca intermediary capital risk, um, is remarkably good at explaining these cross-sectional variation in expected returns. So it's not only enough to say the market beta or the market risk of a particular stock is, I don't know, 1.2. I'm going to tell you, you need to measure another beta. You need to measure also how this stock varies with the capitalization of important financial intermediaries. But just these two quantities I'll show you go a long way in explaining these return differences. For, and this is not just true for equities or bonds. 
This is true when you go to exotic derivatives. This is true when you go to commodities. This is true when you go to uh, foreign exchange contracts. Okay. So it has quite a bit of explanatory power. And in that sense, um, intermediary capital risk is priced everywhere. And what I'll try and discuss uh, are some practical implications of this, uh, of this fact after I convince you that this model is necessary and that it works. But if you think about this, the, the market risk or the, the, the model for risk is necessary if you want to do asset risk management. So if some of you uh, manage portfolios on behalf of your clients, it would be helpful if you can explain to them the risk that they are taking when, they're, when they embark on these investments. So I'm going to say, well, it's not enough that you tell them about their market betas. You should also make them uh, aware of what happens to their portfolio at a time when it is important, when, say, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, at the times when they are undercapitalized. Okay. You, as an asset manager, you should really want uh, to help your clients transfer wealth to those states of the world where financial intermediaries are undercapitalized. Okay. Not just the states of the world where the market as a whole tanks. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're doing valuation, um, so say you wanted to come up with the cost of capital to uh, this really interesting startup ID I just heard this morning. Um, um, about um, using swabs to figure out if you have bed bugs in hotel beds. Then, you know, well, I want to think about the cost of capital for that project. To do that, I need to think about this particular project. I need to think about demand for this pro product. I need to think about how the demand for this product moves, how it varies with the whole market. That's what the CAPM will tell you. You need to calculate a project beta with respect to the market. This theory that I propose now will also say, well, you also need to take into account how financial intermediaries will be capitalized in states of the world that could vary with demand for this product. Now, off the top of my head, it's kind of hard for me to think about it moving at all with, you know, uh, with the capitalization of financial markets, which can be fantastic. That can be great. It means it's not very risky in that regard. Uh, on the other hand, if you think that the financial sector is responsible for a lot of the uh, demand for these swabs, then maybe it does uh, it. So just thinking about co-movement with the capitalization of financial intermediaries, the important one is going to be first order in calculating this cost of capital for the project. Um, all right. For wealth management, from a wealth management perspective. Uh, our model is going to say that if what you want to do is earn high returns, in a rational model, that would always entail taking on some risk. Right? There's no reward without taking risk. But our model is going to tell you where to ship, how to uh, tweak your portfolio, how to allocate it in you know, such a way that you get the most efficient exposure to intermediary capital risk without uh, taking too much idiosyncratic risk. Okay. So once we've identified these two risk factors, market risk and intermediary capital risk, we can now build customized portfolios that efficiently allocate our wealth just to ex get exposure to these two factors. Uh, you may be familiar with, uh, with the value premium, value versus growth, right? So there are factors uh, uh, there are portfolios, there are whole ETFs structured just around these two factors. Um, I would say based on our research, it makes a lot of sense to, to build such portfolios that, um, that expose investors to intermediary capital risk. So a, a close, you know, f uh, a first step at this would be something like, the, uh, like a banking index. But I'm going to show you, it's not really about banking. This is just about um, these large, very large primary dealers. What you want is exposure to the capitalization of primary dealers. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So that's where I'm going. 
So let me start with the cap M. I'm gonna I'm going to start with the cap M, which uh, you probably saw before, but I'm gonna go through a brief reminder of how that one works. It's again a beautiful model. It's theoretically uh, very sound, um, which is probably why we teach it to our uh, to our students. Um, I'll then show you a, a three-factor uh, extension of this. This is called the Fama French three-factor model. You've heard of. And then I'll show you how our model does, uh, and then conclude. So the capital asset pricing model has been here for a long, long time. And it says that market risk is really the only source of systematic risk. This is all, all that really matters for pricing, uh, for explaining variation in expected returns. Risk in that model is measured by covariation with the market portfolio. So the market portfolio itself has a beta of one with itself. If you have a stock that is more risky, this stock has a higher beta than one. So if you have a stock with a beta of two, it's a much more risky stock than the market. If you have a stock that with a beta of zero or minus one, say, that's a stock that's a good hedge. This is a stock that when the market does well, this does poorly, but also when the market does poorly and you're really hungry, really need your money, that stock is going to pay you nicely. Okay, so beta, in the sense of, according to CAPM, is the only thing you need to calculate to measure risk. Now, how much is the how, how much is the price of this risk? So beta, I would say, is the quantity of risk in your in this per, for a particular stock. How much is the price of risk in the market? That is captured in the CAPM by the risk premium on the market portfolio. So in other words, the expected return that you expect to get on the market, less the risk-free rate, think a treasury bill. This market, this is what we call the risk premium on the market, depends on the risk aversion of investors, this A, and the variance of this market return, okay, or the volatility of the market portfolio. But this risk premium, you should think about as the price. So if you go and buy a banana, then you want to think about, okay, how many bananas am I, am I buying? How much pounds of bananas? So what this beta does is it's capturing for us the quantity of the product that we're buying. What this risk premium on the market, this says, okay, this is the price for each unit of risk. Okay, this is the price per banana, or the price per pound of banana. So what the cap bank says is that if I now want to figure out what's the expected return or what's the risk premium on one stock, one individual stock, say IBM stock, then I go and calculate the beta on IBM relative to the market. I take this beta and I multiply it by the market um, by the market risk premium. Okay, so quantity times price gives you the price of the product, total cost of the product. Okay. This is the cost of capital for right now. Make sense? All right. So we love the cap M from a theoretical perspective because many of many assumptions, there are many assumptions you can go and write down that lead to the sort of the same conclusion, lead to these same implications that I just showed you. The model itself is very intuitive. It says that um, it comes from a, a household consumption perspective. It says that people are most hungry when times are bad. When the market does badly, people are very, very hungry. Their marginal value of wealth is enormous. So if you, give, if you had to choose, do you want a dollar in the time when the market tanked, or do you want a dollar in the time when the market is great, say right now? Um, you'd probably say, well, I want that dollar in times when the market is bad, because that's when I'm very hungry. But in the CAPM, this is true. He's going to, the the CAPM says, well, assumes that money is most useful when the average household is hungry. And therefore, investors prefer assets that pay off in such bad times. Now, what's an asset that pays off in bad times? Well, it's an asset that has a low beta. So if, uh, so if it's my startup, if it generates high cash, 
in times when the market tanks, I guess the, 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 the best uh, store for this is a spam manufacturer. So if you manufacture spam, if, this is the, if you have stock on this company, that stock probably pays off better in times when the market tanks. People are poor, they buy more spam. Uh, I, I tend to, I'm sorry, I, I love spam, I should say that. <laughs> but, you know, it's not, it's not considered a, lo a, a luxury good. It should be. Uh, <laughs> But then, the, uh, but what this means is the fact that investors prefer such assets that pay off in bad times. It also means that assets that pay off in good times. So if you have a, some stock that really moves with the market, it only pays off in times when the market does great. Those stocks have high beta, and for you to hold them as an investor, they have to have a relatively low price and a high expected return. So high beta means higher expected return. That's really the intuition of the CAPA. It's initially, it's initially a bit counterintuitive, but when you think about it, it totally makes sense. And from a theory perspective, I was just nodding when they said this, okay, okay, this is great. And in the 70s, we really thought this was working. So there's pioneering research, uh, found on Macbeth a long, long time ago, and said, okay, this is a great model. But it turns out that ever since the 90s or so, early 90s, we've known that the cap band does terribly in the data. It just, it's a terrible model to explain variation in expected returns. So if, if some of you are surprised by this, um, then, uh, um, then you did not take my class. But, uh, <laughs> but, but I would say that, um, Somebody should have thought of this because so I know that in many organizations, and if you're high up there in the organization, I know that somebody working for you is using the CAPM to do valuation. It's just a very simple model um, and very intuitive. It's also one of the most rejected models in economics. Okay. Now you don't get to be a re uh, the most rejected model in economics by writing a bad model. You get to be the most rejected model in economics, but we can get a beautiful model, writing a beautiful model down that totally makes sense, totally makes sense, but then just doesn't fit the data. Um, so this is the CAPM uh, central prediction. The central prediction by the CAPM is that if you calculated expected returns, and each dot here is a mean excess return in percentage points for a particular uh, portfolio of stocks. Uh, the CAPM says that um, if you that stocks that have a higher market risk, a higher beta, should have a higher expected return. Okay. It has even more implications for that. For say the the market portfolio should be in a particular place here. But the the first prediction of the CAPM is that this should be a monotonically increasing line. So all these should line up on the securities market line, as we call. It. So if, if this worked well, all these dots would be on this line. Um, that's not what you see in practice. Okay, not at all. So if a picture sort of like this around the early 90s convinced the long academics that we should go beyond the CAPM. Okay, this is not a good model to take up the data. There's a different way of looking at this. Uh, this, uh, this sort of data that also works for multi-factor models, once you have more than one factor, which is by plotting the excess return, like the, 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 the expected return that's predicted by the model, so that's why I have on the x-axis, and plotting that against the actual mean excess return. Okay. So the way this picture would look like if the model worked, is that again, all stocks, all these dots would line up across the 45 degree diagonal. Uh, that would be a perfect fit of the model to the data. It doesn't look like that at all. Okay. So that tells you, well, there's some factor, if you're, a, if, you're a, if you're doing rational asset pricing, you're thinking, well, there's some factor, some systematic source of risk out there that could explain this data, but it's not the cap -end. So around that same time, in the early 90s, um, a lot of people, and most prominently um, uh, Fama and French, came up with a well, three-factor model. So this happened in 92, 93. 
Um, and if you'll ask uh, Gene Fama, you know, Nobel laureate, how they came up with this model, he'd be very upfront. That this was a fishing expedition. They went and looked at a whole bunch of data and tried a lot of things, and eventually this worked. It's actually remarkable how well their model worked. But this is sort of what they did. They said, okay, this is the CAPM. The CAPM says that the risk premium on an individual asset depends on market risk times the risk premium on the market. But we know there's something missing there. So let's add some factors. And what they figured out is that the value premium, the return that you would get on uh, value stocks, relative to the return you would expect to get on growth stocks, is another such common factor for many expected returns. And then the other one is what we call the size premium. This is the differential return that we expect to get if you uh, go long small stocks and go short large stocks. So they came up with what people like to call the three-factor model. It's an incredibly successful model for equities, and it worked pretty well for many years. Um, it has no theory, but again, it was, it was a fishing expedition, and empirically, um, it looked like it worked better, and it's true. This model, even today, even with today's data, um, it fits equities data much better than the CAPM does. So if all you took away from this lecture and forgot about intermediate asset pricing, <laughs> use the three-factor model as opposed to just the CAPM. But we try to push a little further. So we've known this since the 90s. So we try to be a bit more ambitious. The three-factor model works very well for equities. Okay. But suppose you wanted to price bonds. Suppose you wanted to price options. This is how that model does on options. Okay, again, success of this model would say that all these dots fall along the 45 degree diagonal. This goes exactly the opposite way. Okay. So you cannot price options with, uh, with the Palmer and French three-factor model. Uh, we have many of these plots in the paper. It just it doesn't do as well. But again, this was a fishing expedition, right? You were looking for a model that explains variations, expected returns in equities. And Palmer and French delivered on that. This works pretty well in equities, but not in anything else. So there's been a big push in recent years to shift the focus from households that are in the back of the mind of the theorist as he writes the campaign to find large financial intermediaries. Some of you represent some of large financial intermediaries. We quibble about are you large or not. Uh, but the intermediary asset pricing model starts by shifting the focus from thinking about a person sitting in their home trying to figure out how to allocate their portfolio to a sophisticated financial intermediary that's managing large swaths of wealth. They're fairly savvy, they operate in many financial markets, asset markets simultaneously. And once you think about them as being the marginal investors in markets, the people who actually set prices in financial markets, this whole thing starts to make sense. The variation we see in expected returns starts to make sense. So the premise of the intermediary asset pricing model is that intermediaries are active in almost all asset markets, whereas households are only active in just a few. Very few households trade options. I don't think any household can directly trade CES contracts. Right? None of them have an ease though. It's not happening. On the other hand, sophisticated financial intermediaries can trade all of them. And they can do that, um, and they're going to do that in such a way that will equate the price of risk across all these markets. So suppose a, lot, a sophisticated financial intermediary sits in front of their Bloomberg terminal and sees that they have a great investment opportunities in, say, CDS, 
relative to equities. Well, they're going to shift a lot of their portfolio from equities to CDS until that point where the compensation they get from doing so equates. Where they expect to get sort of the same bang for the buck in equities as they expect to get from CDS. Right? Otherwise, they just keep doing it. So an interesting prediction of this, of this model is that the price of risk across asset classes should equate. Now this is a very ambitious thing to, to hope for when you have just say the cap M or the final friend spirit factor model and you go and try this in any asset classes. But I'll show you, excuse me, that the intermediate asset pricing model actually delivers on this. So the theory, I will not spend too much time on the theory here, but it proposes some proxies for the uh, marginal value of wealth of these intermediaries. For, for what tells me whether a large financial intermediary is willing to bear a lot of risk today or not willing to bear a lot of risk today. So the first determinant of this according to the theory is their net worth. They have a lot of net worth. They are willing to invest a lot. If so in the, I guess in the back of the mind, you should think Goldman Sachs, <coughs> JP Morgan as a whole. If JP Morgan just suffered large losses to the point where their capital ratio, their equity over assets is small, then as an organization, their willingness to bear risk is diminished. They become more risk averse, if you will. This matters a lot for pricing. So we're going to measure their capital ratio. Um, and for every large uh, financial institution you can do this, we will focus on primary dealers. Primary dealers, they're called primary dealers because of, the, of their role in, uh, in helping the New York Fed set monetary policy. We're not thinking about them because of this feature. We're thinking about primary dealers because we were looking for a list of the most of the largest financial players that can, we can go back to the 70s with. And this gave us such a list. So we're going to calculate for all these primary dealers sort of their aggregate capital ratio, their intermediary capital ratio, is what I'm going to call it. So at the, on the numerator, I have the total market equity of all these primary dealers at a point in time. And the on the denominator, I have the, their total market equity plus the total debt that they have on their books. Okay, so think total assets is evaluated by the market. And on the top, I have their total equity. And we're looking at the aggregate here because we're trying to measure asset prices. Arguably, the aggregates are what, map, are what matters. Okay, so this is my most important variable in this talk. Intermediary capital ratio. So this captures again total equity divided by total assets of these primary dealers. Our two-factor model. I promised a small extension to the CAPM. So forget for this for the moment the um, value premium, the size premium. I don't need any of that. All that I need for my model is the exposure to market risk, beta with respect to the market, times the market uh, premium. Right? That's the, essentially the cap M is here in black. Plus a beta with respect to changes in this intermediary capital ratio. Okay. So you go, you calculate the intermediary capital ratio, figure out, okay, sometimes it's high, sometimes it's low. Calculate exposure beta with respect to this intermediary capital ratio. And that's this whole pricing model. So if you have this person in your organization that knows how to use the cap M, they will be able to use this. It's just instead of running a regression with one variable, they're going to run a regression with two variables. This information is on my website. Really easy to get. And it turns out that this simple extension to the cap M makes a world of difference. 
it's also it's intuitive. Before I show how this works in the data, let me convince you for a second that it's intuitive. It says that money is most useful not at a time when the household is hungry, when the average household is hungry. The average household doesn't matter for pricing assets. They can't trade most of the assets we care about. It says that money is most useful at a time when intermediary capital is low. So what I want, so you have all have probably experienced the financial crisis in 2008. If you could transfer wealth to those states of the world where the sky was falling in Wall Street, so that you have money now to invest, if you were bold at that point, you bought bank stocks, right? There was a story yesterday in the Wall Street Journal about people who did exactly this. So if you can transfer money to the point in time when intermediaries are undercapitalized, that's a great idea. What the intermediary, cap, uh, what the intermediary asset pricing model is going to say that uh, those intermediaries and investors prefer assets that pay off in bad times. But now what does a bad time mean here? A bad time means that they have a, <coughs> this, uh, this stock has a low beta with respect to the capital ratio of these financial intermediaries. Those, those assets that have a low beta, those are good hedges. Assets that have a high beta, so for example, if you just bought asset, the stock of the intermediaries, for example, okay, so if you buy JP Morgan stock, that's a stock that's going to have a very high beta with respect to the uh, intermediate capital ratio. Such stock have to offer high expected returns for you to be willing to hold them. Okay, because they only pay off in good times. Okay, so these are the primary deals we have in mind. Um, I'm only putting this on the board here so that you can see that the largest financial players uh, as of 2014 are all on this list. So, uh, in these uh, 20 or so primary dealers dominate securities market. Uh, they have a, an enormous share of all trade. Um, some of them have been there for a long time, some for uh, uh, not so much. We are measuring their capital ratios at the holding company level. So if you think about, say, JP Morgan, they have a subsidiary called JP Morgan Securities LLC. This is really their broker dealer. We're not looking at them. We're looking at JP Morgan Chase and Company as a whole, cutting their capital ratio. Okay, so this is what I'll just show you some pictures. So the blue line here is this intermediary capital ratio. This is the aggregate capital ratio of all the primary dealers from the 70s until 2000. And what? What's the uh, vertical axis measuring? Uh, so this figure is standardized so that I can put two lines at the same place, but you should think about that as uh, units of standard deviation. Uh, I don't know if that helps, but the, the intermediary capital risk factor um, is changes to the blue line. Okay? It's in innovations to the intermediary capital ratio. And we're looking at innovations because this is sort of, you should think about this as, uh, it's very close to the return on those primary dealers. So suppose you invested in primary dealers, this would be very close to the return you would get on that portfolio. The shaded regions are uh, NBER recessions. These are times when the US economy uh, doesn't grow much. So there are two things that I like seeing about this figure. One, I like seeing that the intermediary capital risk factor, the, the dashed line, I like to see that it tanks during the financial crisis. That's, the, you know, if it didn't work, if, if that wasn't the case, I would be very surprised. But this is also, but this also happens to be a recession. So the whole market tanks at this point. Okay, so the whole market tanks at this point. So that's not that interesting. Like if it just has a market risk factor, that would also capture this. But what I also like saying about the intermediary capital risk factor is this episode in 1998. What happened in 1998? Dot com. 
It was the Asian, Asian crisis. Yeah, the Asian. Dot com was here. The uh, Asian uh, crisis is probably a bit closer. What really triggered this, uh, with this sudden drop and then bounce back in the capital ratios of financial intermediaries um, is uh, long-term capital management and uh, Russia defaulting all of the blue in, in 1998. Okay, so this was almost a pure financial shock. This is a time when financial intermediaries got hit over the head, but the economy as a whole probably never heard of this. Okay, didn't experience any of that. So our intermediary capital risk factor is going to capture this sort of variation. Okay. Most interesting part of it, the, the exposure to intermediary capital risk, is about, suppose the market does OK, but the intermediary sector tanks, or the opposite, does very well. Those are episodes when there is a lot of intermediary capital risk. So we're going to take this model and apply it to uh, many, many asset classes all at the same time. I'm going to look at them separately, but also all at the same time. I'm going to look at equity portfolios, 25 equity portfolios, uh, US bond portfolios, sovereign bonds, options, CDS, commodities, foreign exchange uh, futures. And it turns out that when you use this model to Explain this very explain variation in expected returns. Um, it works well in all of them, and it doesn't just work well in the sense that you get a positive price of risk. That's very interesting. We get a positive price of risk, and it's super important. Uh, like if I showed you that in one market, beta with respect to intermediary capital risk is has a positive price, and in another market has a negative price. I would say you should go back to the drawing board because this is a bad, this is a wrong, this is a wrong model to think about. Um, but no, we find a positive price of intermediary capital risk, which suggests that intermediaries value a dollar more in states when dealers have low capital. But remarkably, what we find is that the price of risk, this risk premium on the intermediary capital is remarkably similar, quantitatively similar across all these asset classes. Let me show you how this picture looks like. So if you had a, so what, what I'm showing you here is the intermediary capital risk premium by asset class. And this is measured in percent return quarterly. Okay, so the, for all portfolios together, as this dot here, there's about a 9% uh, um, uh, quarterly return on this intermediary capital risk factor. And the risk premium is 9%. So if you had a, an asset with a beta of 1 on intermediary capital risk, not on the market, on intermediary capital risk, it would generate 9% a quarter. This price is positive and it's different from zero. That's what these error bars are trying to show. And it turns out if you go into each separate asset market, so here, these are equities, these are US bonds, these are sovereign bonds uh, that are not US ones. These are options, CDS contracts, commodities, or foreign exchange futures. From a statistical standpoint, all these, all, all these dots are exactly the same. And even without the statistical uh, error bars, this is a remarkably flat line. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to show you how other theories uh, or other models do in the data. They're all over the place. So pick your favorite factor model. Maybe you guys have an empirically motivated one that you use in your organization. And try and do this exercise with, uh, with your data. It's really simple. Um, you're going to find lines that cross zero a bunch of times and probably just a bunch of zeros. This is this data in a, in a table. Let me skip that. Um, now, I've shown you before these pictures of what happens when you use the, <coughs> the, the CAPM to explain your data or the Thomas Fritz prefactor model to explain your data. And I told you that when you plot actual 
versus predicted average access returns, a measure of fit of your models. So a good model would all line up on the 45 degree angle. Let me show you how this intermediary asset pricing model works. So if I throw equities, 25 equities portfolios, and all these, these are uh, stocks sorted by size and uh, book to market. They fall really close to this 45 degree diagonal. If I throw US bonds on that line, those are the green dots here, also follow the line pretty well. These would be sovereign bonds that are not US bonds fall on the 45 degree diagonal. These are options. If you remember how this picture looked like for, uh, for the Fama Friends 3 factor model, it looked essentially like a, a, a line that goes exactly the, the wrong way. We can explain a lot of the variation in options portfolio. What is the time sequence of those, uh, those periods? Yeah. How, 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 how long is the period that you measure? So, it, it's, it's a bit mixed here. For equities, this would be 1970 to 2012. And for, we try to get all the data it's we big, can. It's a big wide range. Oh, yeah. it, it's, as, it's as long as we could get. Because measuring, uh, measuring expected returns is actually pretty tricky from a statistical standpoint. You need a really long time series before you can make strong statistical inferences. So for, uh, for equities, we have a lot of data. We have a long time series. This is also true for US bonds. We have a shorter data uh, sample for sovereign bonds uh, and an even shorter one for options. So options data would start in the mid-90s and go until 2012. Um, these are CDS contracts. The, these circles here also line up fairly well along this diagonal. Uh, CDS contracts would start in the early 2000s. These are commodities. We do well on this in the sense that they're, uh, <laughs> they, they're along the diagonal, but this commodities data is very, very noisy. Um, we don't do as well as, uh, as I'd like on them. Uh, these are foreign exchange futures. They're very close to that diagonal. In a, in a recent test, we also tried to apply this to exotic bonds. So you can go to Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and find these uh, CMBS indices, muni bonds indices, high yield. These are fairly exotic bonds. No, no household will probably trade these. But some sophisticated intermediaries do. And you can see that even them, even they fall along this, uh, fall along this line. So variation in their expected returns can also be explained by this model. Um, now, I, I, I try to give you a or a, a jump into the frontier of asset pricing where we are today. We did not go from the 90s to 2017 without other theories and models that being suggested along the way. So there's, a, there's, a set, there's literally a zoo of asset pricing factors that have been suggested over the years. Um, it turns out that if you, if you horse race, if you will, our factor model with those previously suggested factor models, our horse comes out on top, or wins the race, so I'm not sure what's the right thing to say this for a horse race, I'm not watching for horse races. Um, but, um, but the fact that this coefficient here, the first one, is statistically significant is what we're looking for. And it turns out that if you race this against the CAPM, I showed you the Fama French two factor model, there's a recently suggested Fama French five factor model, uh, momentum, there's a liquidity factor, uh, there's um, uh, in a market asymmetry factor, our model survives all of them. So uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of details on, uh, on these complete models, I just wanted to explain it. We've thought about this, if you're very interested in the details that are in the paper, but I'm not going to go uh, in much detail over this. Okay. So it, let, let me quickly conclude. Uh, what we show in this paper is that the exposure of assets to changes in the capital ratio of primary dealers, exposure to intermediary capital ratio changes, can explain a lot of the variation that we see in expected access returns across a wide range of asset classes. So this fact is true not just in equities, which is the bulk 
of the research in asset pricing. It's true in, for U.S. bonds, for foreign sovereign bonds, for options, CDS contracts, commodities, and currencies. These, uh, these findings that we have, they suggest that thinking of financial intermediaries as these price-setting investors, marginal investors, makes a lot of sense in many asset markets. And that the financial soundness of these intermediaries is actually more important than market risk. Um, if what you want to do is understand asset pricing behavior across these asset classes and even within them. Um, that's all I had to say. Uh, I hope that this helps. Um, I would really like to hear questions if you have any. Um, yes, please. Um, thank you. This is this is wonderful. Um, I have, my question for you is. Oh, thank you. Have you considered whether um, whether the uh, intermediary capital ratio is the effect rather than the cause of um, of this uh, asset pricing behavior? In other words, have you considered whether whether this uh, the capital ratio is an indicator of something else um, underlying that 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 might you know really uh, be pulling the strings here? So, so your question is spot on. So. Um, in asset pricing, I would say we have this chicken and egg problem is very severe. So it's, it's so severe to the point where um, we, the, our way of trying to, um, to answer it has moved to thinking within models. So our first hurdle is thinking about, okay, does, does the asset pricing model make sense? Okay, now let me take this asset pricing model and think about all of the implications that this theory has because it's very hard to generate um, um, we would call this exogenous variation or to do natural experiments with asset pricing, right? Um, so, the, the, so the findings that I will report or the results that I will report uh, are sort of, sort of very similar to what I've shown you here. But if I were trying to be a bit more careful, I would say, well, there's quite a few theories um, that would generate very similar predictions. Okay. So you can, come, you can say, well, maybe it's not intermediary capital risk that really matters. Maybe there is some New York City workers strikes, then that's really what's driving everything here. Um, I would not have much to say whether that's true or not. What I will be able to say is that okay, that ultimate cause is approximate cause, which is the intermediary capital ratios uh, are going to are going to move around. And if all that I, I so from a practical perspective, it would be sufficient for you as a uh, portfolio manager or uh, somebody that's doing valuation to calculate betas with respect to this uh, proximate cause, if you will. But you are spot on that if we could, we would like to understand these ultimate causes uh, a, a little bit. Um, it's just a very hard thing to do, especially when you're looking at macroeconomic uh, quantities, uh, and, and, and that's what we do. How often did you calculate the capital ratios for the intermediaries? Um, so the results that I showed you here today are quarterly. So most for the, uh, so for example, for their debt, which we need for their assets, we, we only have quarterly data. Mm -hmm. um, we can calculate their market equity at a higher frequency. Um, mm -hmm. So if you go on my website, you'll see three uh, uh, files. There'll be a quarterly series, a monthly series, and a daily series uh, that starts in 2000. Um, so for the for the shorter frequencies, we can get very similar results. Um, but uh, tell me, and, and within that data, tell me about the, the issue of survivor bias. I mean, we all remember there was an E.F. Hutton once, there was a Kidder Peabody once. Lehman. Yeah. So <laughs> how did you? Did you adjust for that? Are those, because you listed 14 primary dealers, I'm presuming you didn't, you just used those back through history. 
No, no, no. So, so the concern, if I understood you correctly, yeah. is that you know these firms. This is the list as of 2014, but there were other players that used to be important in, say, 1990. So, uh, so for example, uh, Lehman Brothers is not here. They were sort of important until 2008, um, not hiring anymore for us. The, uh, so we do, we, we, we use this list, so our panel of primary dealers looks at every point in time, who is on the primary dealer list of the New York Fed, and we use those banks. But that could also create some survivorship bias, as you mentioned. Like, for example, um, on the quarter when Lehman Brothers leaves the sample, there's a big uh, drop in leverage, I would say. So there's an increase in equity of this sector, if you, if you just ignore this. So fortunately for us, um, or you could say we thought about this ahead of time, we're looking at aggregates exactly for this reason. So we're looking at the total market equity of all primary dealers, and divide this by total uh, market assets of all the primary dealers. So if, um, if Barclays is in our list, and they purchase Lehman Brothers, we're still going to be able to see this capital that's in the financial sector, uh, even if Lehman drops out of our sample. And that's usually what tends to happen when, uh, when a primary dealer leaves our sample. Um, when they enter, they are fairly small. But when they leave, it's usually because somebody buys them out. Um, and then they remain in our sample. Yes? You mentioned your website. Could you tell us what that website is? Or uh, should we just Google you? You should. You should just Google my name. That's, a, that's how I find it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I wish our, uh, our IT would figure out a, a way to give shorter names to the uh, shorter <laughs> addresses to our, uh, to our websites, but uh, Googling it is, uh, is the way to go. Yes? Uh, this model is brilliant. Is, is what you're saying just from a common sense point of view that you have to adjust the risk premiums by the risk profile of the investor over time? I mean, you're... you're differentiating intermediaries versus households, but what you're actually doing is saying, well, how we do the risk premium depends over time on what the risk profile of the investor is. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So the, we started with this idea that, okay, let me think about an investor, and over time they're gonna have their, their risk appetite. So some people, you know, when they see the market tank, they say, well, risk aversion uh, increased in the market. We like to think about, okay, what's driving this risk aversion, this appetite for risk? And we tend to think about the net worth of individuals as something that moves this around. When people are rich, they're more willing to take on risk. When they're poor, not so much. So that was our first step. The second step was to say, okay, well, if what I'm trying to do is explain these aggregate quantities, Expected returns in the market. I don't really um, looking at the individual household is not the right place to look. I should really look at these large financial intermediaries because they set prices. They're so large that they their trading behavior, their risk appetite is what's important here. So now let me think about their risk appetite and what moves that around. And we found this one variable that seems to be very correlated very correlated with their willingness to take on risk. The capital ratio of primary dealers. But that's essentially it, I think you got. Yes. So what I'm trying to wrap my head around is the implication of your theory. And, and so let me ask the question this way. In the five of French model, if their factors were working, you would overweight value stocks, you would overweight small cap stocks. And, and theoretically then, based on their model, that would outperform a market basket of stocks. Tell us what the implication of your model is. Tell us how, if we're investing for households, we take advantage of this. Yeah, well, so um, if, if you wanted to take this to, your, to uh, the investment portfolios of your clients, 
and I would say, well, you can invest in the market, that would give you a certain expected rate of return. But if you now also expose them to the capital risk, to the capital risk factor, intermediary capital risk factor, you would expect to get a higher return on average. Okay, so tweaking, tilting that portfolio towards intermediary capital risk. But, but, but how do you do that? That's, that's the question. So what do we do? Do we buy J.P. Morgan? So, to, uh, no, this, this is exactly this is a great question. So in, in, if you go on my website, there are two series, really. Uh, one of them is this uh, intermediary capital risk factor. Uh, and that may be hard to build a portfolio on, on this thing. There's another variable right there. It's called the valuated uh, investment return. In intermediary in, in, in these very large intermediaries and that's a very easy thing to do so take all primary dealers okay evaluate them and hold that portfolio okay this would be a evaluated a portfolio that gives you the evaluated return on financial intermediaries okay. so going in and out of this portfolio is a slightly different direction than just trading on the market and our, our model says that longing that portfolio should generate above average returns. Now, I would not say that you're taking advantage of it. What you're doing is you're exposing your clients to this risk, but you would expect to get rewarded for this, according to our model. Make sense? Thank you so much. This was great. Um, For those of you, there's actual copies of the paper out here, or we can email it to you electronically. Um, but we do need to close. But if you want to stay and have an additional conversation, we'll be here for a little bit longer. And I want to thank you again. Our next event is January 11th. January 11th. And uh, Dean Mahendra Gupta will be presenting some of his research. So mark your calendar. Love to see you. Thank you.